Uh, so chemotherapy really refers to any drug treatment of any disease. Um, in an oncology or cancer setting, it's talking about anti-cancer drugs, and they're usually drugs that are designed to try and directly kill cancer if possible. Uh, and that can be used in a couple of different settings. So either it could be uh, before surgery to try and either reduce the tumour size or reduce the chance down the track of the cancer coming back from cells that might have already escaped. It could be after surgery to try and mop up any cells that could be left behind. Um, or unfortunately, sometimes it's when the cancer's returned and we might be giving chemotherapy to try and get that back under control to hopefully get people to live as long as possible. If uh, the cancer is a little bit more aggressive and it's looking like it might be penetrating into deeper layers of the bladder, that's so we might need to think about something that gets into the bloodstream to, to have a better effect on the bladder. So the terminology of neoadjuvant uh, chemotherapy just means prior to surgery. So having the chemotherapy as really the first treatment while waiting for surgery. Um, so that the goal of neoadjuvant chemotherapy would be a couple of things. One would be trying to shrink the tumour in the hope that the surgery is more successful and that there's nothing left behind after the surgery. Mm -hmm. The second would be if there's been any cells already escape and circulating around the body, we hope that giving the chemo as early as possible means that you might mop up those cells earlier. As as adjuvant a, yeah, mm -hmm. um, adjuvant chemotherapy would be chemotherapy given after surgery. So some, often there's not much of a wait to, to have the surgery and someone might go straight in the following week. Mm -hmm. um, but there might be some features on the pathology report, like it looking bigger than expected. It might be that some of the lymph nodes were taken out, had some cancer spread in them. Maybe the, bladder was, uh, the cancer was going through the wall of the bladder. And the thought is that if nothing's done, that the risk of that coming back could be quite high. So then we give chemotherapy afterwards to try and stop it growing back either in the same area, in the lymph nodes nearby, or possibly spreading somewhere else. So it's not a guarantee that it won't return, uh, but it reduces the chances of it coming back later on. I mean, that kind of chemotherapy is given more like what most people will have seen with chemotherapy. So it's a matter of coming in and having it through a drip into your arm. Um, so usually as an outpatient, but coming in for the day to a chemotherapy centre. Um, and then the drug's given one after the other through the drip. And then the side effects are much more what people traditionally see people having with chemotherapy. So biggest things would be things like nausea or possibly vomiting. Um, having an effect on their bowels. Some other drugs can make you constipated, bowel function can fluctuate. Um, fatigue is probably the biggest side effect that people notice. And that accumulates. The more treatments you have, the more tired, the more run down you can be. Mm -hmm. There can be a little bit of hair loss. It's not usually uh, complete hair loss, uh, but it can definitely get hair thinning. So it's certainly having a much bigger impact on your quality of life and ability to continue to do your normal things when having normal chemotherapy. I think really everyone would have some side effects from their treatment. We do have some people that are quite stoic and manage to push through and still work and do all their normal things, um, but they'd certainly find that their um, stamina is not as good. They might find that their working hours would be shorter, be a little bit more tired. Um, and it can, one of our biggest concerns is the effect on the immunity. So the way that chemotherapy drugs work is they kill everything in the body that's growing and they can't tell what's a cancer cell and what's uh, a normal cell of the body. What we know though is that cancer cells are not very good at fixing themselves. So if you damage them, they tend to die. Uh, normal cells of the body, they know how to regenerate and repair. So it's kind of balancing that, hoping that you're killing the cancer cells and hoping you're not killing too many normal cells, um, but really it's gonna cause some side effects you know, along the way. Um, so the best way to try and maintain your normal immune system would be to be uh, keeping as healthy lifestyle as you can so trying to eat a reasonably balanced diet and we do try to discourage people from doing a lot of the kind of crazy diets they read about or people tell them about and to try and keep a reasonably balanced diet keeping uh, fit so there are a lot of people who feel they need to sit around and do nothing during chemo then that would be best for them but actually there's a lot of proof that exercise during during chemotherapy can help both with the side effects of the chemo and might actually make it um, more effective if you're circulating the bloodstream more, perhaps that that's getting a better circulation and more chemotherapy dosing is getting to the tumour. Um, there isn't really a good way to completely counteract you're going to get some effect on the immune system, really no matter what you do, but hopefully it can be mitigated if you're otherwise keeping pretty fit and healthy. 
Really, most of the um, alternative therapies that people kind of look into are based on uh, small numbers of patients or a case report. Someone said something they did might have helped. And what can unfortunately happen is people tell those stories, but they don't also um, explain that they're having chemotherapy at the same time. So they might say, I did uh, X, Y, Z diet and that cured my cancer, but don't mention that they actually also had their surgery and their chemotherapy at the same time. Uh, so obviously we try to... Um, discuss those things with patients and not completely exclude the alternative therapies and things that people can be doing but try to advise around treatments that might uh, be detrimental during their treatment mm -hmm. and and hopefully we can perhaps get through the standard chemotherapy first and look at the alternative therapies perhaps afterwards when we know they're not going to interfere. Um, so in regards to advances to chemotherapy, I haven't heard anything about the mistletoe therapy, to be honest. Um, but in the last probably five to ten years, there's been really a huge increase in the number of trials and research being done in bladder cancer. And that's been based on uh, some very encouraging early results in small numbers of patients where immune therapy can be really very helpful in bladder cancer. We're at the point now where worldwide there's be maybe even 100 or so different trials combining chemotherapy either with, um, sorry, combining immunotherapy either with chemotherapy or radiation or even as maybe prevention after surgery. And we've got a number of those trials in the hospitals in Sydney kind of running at the moment. So uh, immunotherapy is a little bit different to chemotherapy. So chemo works to try and directly poison cancer cells or kill them. Immune therapy is about actually stimulating your own immune system in the hope that if you can stimulate it, it might notice that the cancer cells are foreign, just like an infection, and hopefully directly kill the cancer cells using your own immune system as the tool to do that. Obviously, that has slightly opposite side effects to chemotherapy because rather than lowering your immune system, you're actually activating or ramping up the immune system. And the side effects from that can be that your immune system starts to attack normal cells of your body. Um, so it can cause inflammation almost of any other organ in the body. So the biggest risks with it are that you suddenly think that your liver or your lungs is a foreign thing and you can inflame your lungs or you can inflame your liver. Um, you can get kind of rashes and muscle and joint aches and pains because of that ramping up of the immune system. So there's a huge amount of public interest in immune therapy, thinking that maybe it won't be toxic like chemotherapy, but it's kind of really taking us all a bit by surprise of uh, those those side effects that we possibly didn't expect now that immune therapy is being used a little bit more, uh, that the medical community in general is having to catch up pretty quickly on that some of those side effects can be quite severe. It's still giving intravenously, so still needing to come to a hospital, having a drip put in. a similar schedule, so it's usually once every two weeks or once every three weeks intravenously, usually a shorter duration of the drip going and it doesn't have the traditional things like nausea and hair loss but more of the severe side effects that we mentioned. So the prognosis of bladder cancer varies entirely on on the stage of the cancer so when it is superficial or confined just to the the surface layers of the bladder the chance of that coming back um, in the same area is reasonably, it can be up to about 50% if it's a high grade or you've had lots of little tumours in the bladder, um, but that can be reduced a lot with the treatments given into the bladder. And it only has a very t minuscule chance of that becoming more serious and spreading somewhere else as long as it's treated effectively. If it's got to the point of going into the deeper layers of the bladder, whether that be into the muscle or beyond, then the chances, that means it's breached the bloodstream and it can get into the blood vessels and spread to other areas. Um, a lot of the time we hope that you know, it's still cured with the bladder being removed, either with or without you know, the radi um, chemotherapy before and after it. Um, if it has spread beyond the bladder to other organs of the body, there's only a small chance of that being cured and people being alive and well five years later. So it really depends on the stage in the body, um, sometimes the kind of cancer cells, because they're not all identical in every body, um, and how aggressive that was. So when you're looking to see if there has been any spread of cancer anywhere else, there unfortunately isn't a simple blood test. So there, there hasn't been identified something like uh, the PSA test for prostate cancer where we can screen for it. So the things we're left to really having to look at having CT scans or bone scans to look for those things afterwards. And that might be done usually routinely. So if someone's had their bladder out or they've had um, a bladder cancer bad enough to need chemotherapy or radiation, 
we'd normally, at least for the first couple of years, look at doing those scans maybe every four to six months to look, you know, just preemptively to see if we can find something there. Um, and beyond that, it just gets less frequent with time as it gets further away from the time of diagnosis. Or if someone comes and says they've got a symptom, obviously we do a test specifically for that. But no, there's not a really simple way of saying, let's check a blood test, looking for it coming back. The scans being used for bladder cancer is the MRI scans are being used a little bit more frequently to assess the primary tumour, um, although they're still not funded by the government. So it does come at a cost to patients to have to pay for an MRI scan. And that's usually done as a planning for surgery to see how extensive the cancer might be and to make sure that it can be removed safely with surgery. But in terms of the other scans, there hasn't been a lot of change in the types of CT scan and bone scan for quite a few years. The CT might be a little bit more detailed than it was before um, and we do occasionally use PET scans for bladder cancer uh, to, if we're suspicious of something that's spread but again it's not a test that's funded by the government unfortunately.